to the IUPUI Center for Translating, into Re Translating Research into Practice conversation series with our scholars of the month. This month, we're featuring Dr. Mark Ertel. So glad that you're here. The Center for Translating Research into Practice was conceived um, some years back at IUPUI by Charles Vance and Sandra Petronio. Sandra was the creative thinker behind having the center that identifies translational research and is uh, celebrating that work. And so we've started this monthly series to help celebrate the work of our scholars here on campus. And I wanna share my screen with you a little bit um, as I bring that up. My name is Steve Viweg. I'm the Associate Director of the Center, and it's a pleasure to host these sessions with you. But today we're gonna hear from uh, Mark Ertel, who is an amazing scholar in our campus, and I know we're gonna have a great conversation. But before we get into that, we'd like to just remind you about Zoom. We're all familiar with Zoom now, but please keep your microphones muted. And uh, so that keeps background noise to a minimum. You're welcome to leave your video screens on so we can see who's here, especially as we get to the conversation portion where we would invite you to unmute if you wanna join the conversation, but certainly there's the chat feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We invite you to submit questions or comments as Mark shares some of his initial thoughts before we would dive into the conversation. Just so you know, we are recording this presentation. It is also on Facebook Live. So if that's a concern for you, you, may, you can choose to uh, participate with your camera and voice or not. But we like to have it available for others who couldn't be here. You will also receive afterwards a link to an evaluation. We love to hear what you're thinking about and that helps us plan for future events like this. So you can keep up to date by what's going on. Um, and by checking us out on our website, you'll also find now that these, um, these sessions are available for continuing ed. So if you're somebody that's looking for continuing education needs of some kind, you can sign up and keep track of attendance at these monthly sessions to gain some continuing education units. We're uh, very live on social media, so there's different ways that you can follow us to see what's going on. We try to do our best to keep everybody informed about the amazing translational work that's going on here in our campus. So pick your way that you might wanna follow us and let us know what's going on in your world as well. If you haven't yet, you can go to the website and you'll see that we have um, our scholars that we are um, highlighting. So you can find Mark this month. If you look at the website, you'll be able to scroll down and see all of the scholars that have a special page that includes some additional information about them. And once you get down to say Dr. Mark Ertel, you can click on his picture and it'll bring up his own page. Then you can find out some more information about the work that he's doing, uh, a link to see his video where he's talking about his work. And then really interestingly is all of his scholarly works that are on what we call scholar work. So you can click on any of these links here if you wanna read more about his work without having to get the publication and you can go to the IUPUI Scholar Works page and see what that looks like, where you have access at no cost to you to see his scholarly work. It's accessible to you in any way then that you might want to use that or to better understand what's, what's going on at IUPUI and how that might be available to our friends in the community. So, um, upcoming events next month, we have our June Scholar of the Month. We'll be talking with Dr. Phil Cochran, and this will be a very interesting topic. He's wanting us to prepare for the next black swan. And if you're not sure what that means, I invite you to look it up because this is a session you'll not want to miss. It's a little anxiety producing, but I think it's going to be a good conversation for us. But today we are here to talk with our colleague, Dr. Mark Ertel, who is the chair of the Department of Kinesiology at IEPY. And he's a youth sport, fitness, and physical activity specialist who works on developing comprehensive school physical activity programs for school-age youth to be more physically active. He's also part of the group behind that amazing IUPUI fitness garden we have. I don't know if you've seen that yet, but you should go check it out. It's available to all. It's accessible, and it helps encourage us. In fact, it's a place we could go to when we start coming back to campus to just um, have a, a place to go chill out, try out some different exercise equipment, maybe some things you don't have at home, but we wanna use 
out in this wonderful, beautiful space. But we're here today to let him talk to us about his work and learn more about physical activity. So I will invite Dr. Ertel to share his screen and to begin to talk to us. Welcome. My name is Mark Ertel. I've been at IPUI for about 28 years. 21 of those years, I've been working somehow in the community campus partnership collaboration, service learning, civic engagement. Um, and really, I am a face of the Department of Kinesiology. There's a lot of great people doing the work that we do here. And in review, kinesiology, the study, study and science of human movement, that's expressed as physical activity, light to moderate, moderate to vis uh, vigorous, play, exercise, sport. And we're unique in the department because we focus on individuals of all ages and all ability levels. So we like to think of ourselves as really a comprehensive look into promoting physical activity for the entire uh, population. When we look at uh, today, what I'd like to accomplish today would be one, expand the awareness of our, the positive outcomes from being physically active. I think that's important to reiterate broadly. Recast how we consider capacity for in-school interventions. As uh, Steve had mentioned prior um, and during the introduction, my work is primarily positioned within school, the school framework for youth. Uh, we also have, I'd like to engage more collaborators collaborators and stakeholders in the conversation. I think the more people get talking about the positive outcomes of physical activity for all populations and all ages, uh, the better. I'd like to showcase again, take this opportunity to showcase much of the work we do in the department. I'm just the front porch. Uh, my colleagues, uh, we, we do really good work as it relates to this space and also focus on community campus partnerships. That really is, I think, the grounding of translating research into practice. Now, in some regard, I am a literalist. When I think about translating, I look at the definition, expressing something in simpler, different terms. The work I do, and I'm just going to go ahead and put a blitz on this. When you look at these four elements, this is the work that I do. This is where I've spent my career, my training. Some of you might know all, some, or none of those. Today, we're going to talk about how these work together to achieve some outcomes. But here's the deal with kinesiology. We have an area that focuses on nutrition, an area area that focuses on youth physical activity, an area that focuses on personal training. The good news, everybody in society can see themselves in our work. Everybody is active. Everybody eats. Everyone has been around, been a child and participated in player sport. The negative is everybody can see themselves in our space. And I say that because sometimes when you see the work that we do, it's not totally visible what goes on behind the scenes. So on this first slide, if you're not familiar with the terms, this takes a long time to get and to help our students understand. The reality is when people see the work in the community, here's what people see. Students playing a game, after school, doing different things, and then there's a survey. As a result, it, it, things might get lost in translation. So my hope today is for us to kind of talk a little bit about how physical activity can promote various outcomes and in particular for school-aged youth. Now, I am, again, I, I promised Steve I was not going to do PowerPoint karaoke today, and I am not. So I'm going to give you just another listing. And here's why I'm, I'm oops, I'm, I'm going to give you that listing, is if you're asking how and why would uh, physical activity, physical education, sport, have its way in social and emotional learning or not just be exclusive to the health outcomes. What I would draw your attention to is in the field that we started in physical education for the longest time, there's always been a connection, albeit anecdotal, albeit correlational to some degree early on that a sound body and sound mind is a principle that has stood the test of time. So I say this to you that we have been firmly situated in this space for a long period of time. However you see yourself in that list, uh, somewhat reverse chronological, I guess, uh, starting earlier, going later, would be, uh, and I'll draw your attention to number eight, even as recent as um, two months ago, uh, 
The CDC comes out with a strong position statement that school-based physical activity, in fact, improves the social and emotional climate for learning. There are great things to be had with an active and robust school curriculum that affords children opportunities to accumulate those very important minutes of physical activity. Now, how that looks, how successful, those are all debatable, but I did want to set the stage of why this conversation is so important to our work and the work that I particularly do. If you're unfamiliar with SEL, social emotional learning, what I would ask and draw your attention to would be this slide and the diagram, and then eventually is going to be a resource. It really focuses on in a tax taxonomy based element, students ability to be aware, identify, regulate and enhance their, uh, their ways to navigate a school day in their various relationships with themselves, with the building, with the teacher and with their peers. Uh, do they present and develop a social and emotional standpoint uh, that allows them to learn and, and be a citizen in the school? So that's one element. So if you weren't familiar with that phrase at the beginning, you are now. Second of all, and here's a resource, if you want to ever look at it, go to Castle, the Collaborator for Academic Social Emotional Learning, founded around 2001. It's really been a great driver in how we, now there's other organizations, uh, but this is one that tends to uh, be prominent within that. CISPAP, for those of us that have been in physical education for a long period of time, we know that uh, physical education or gym teachers, and again, the reason that's important in being in the schools is that if kids spend more than half their waking hours at school, it's an acceptable place to consider interventions. The problem is that it's, we've been, our industry is at the biggest fault. They have developed maybe gym teachers more than physical educators or physical activity specialists. So the, in 2008, the largest group group of individuals that focuses on the profession thought about reestablishing how to uh, consider physical education in the building as more, of as more of a physical activity specialist, take advantage of different parts of the day in school physical education before and after school, get the family involved in unattached school time, get the staff involved, and then physical activity during the school day, the classroom teacher leading these three, five, seven, 10 minute bouts of brain breaks. I use that as a double quote because we don't like to call them brain breaks. We like to call them brain boosts. They're ways to get kids engaged and active. So we think about that. The ultimate goal of somebody coordinating those efforts is to get a student from zero to six 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity on a regular basis. That tends to promote some of these outcomes we're mentioning. And we're going to talk about it. The reality to date, not the, the level of success has not quite been there. So in summary so far, we're looking at SEL, social emotional learning, and an intervention in the school. And if you back up even from that and we start looking at these, we know the positive health outcome, the positive outcomes of being physically active are the health outcomes. We can think of those literally within the framework of a level of muscle fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness, cardiovascular fitness, body composition. We have those. Then we have these behavioral outcomes, right? A, a student's ability to pay attention, to focus on the task, to kind of manage self. And then we have the academic readiness outcome. I'm not saying learning. There's so many things that impact learning, but you can enhance the academic readiness of a student to be ready to learn. And I think those are the elements that we're really focusing on. So once you combine those, now we can take a look at the sport education model. I run intramural sports programs, in-school interventions, physical education programs within schools, or I have in the past and currently do so. Where my work lives is now looking at intramural sports. Now that's very different using the sport education model, very different than traditional sport. And here's what I mean by that. And this is not bad. I'm just showing the difference. In traditional sports programs, especially for youth, you're going to get activities that are skill drill, practice based. They're going to offer rules. They're going to get into gameplay. It's going to look like the adult version. It is eliminative because that's how the real world works, according to some of those in there. And then the goal is to win. Now, this is typical. When we look at youth sport from all the different levels, I would say 95 to 99% of what you would see and experience looks like that. And that's not a bad thing. It is what it is, but it's very different than offering sport using the sport education model. 
the and as long as we're explicit on that those are okay because there are a lot of good life lessons that come along for the ride in the traditional sport the problem is it's really not social and emotional learning based a lot of times maybe not even health outcomes based and for sure not academic readiness what i would differentiate for you would be the sport education model which was uh, built by daryl seed in 1984 where you teach the concepts of a sport first. There's really no skill drills with the cone, do this, cut here, do that. It's talk about the concepts first. What does offense mean? What does defense mean? What does individual technical skills mean? What do team tactical skills mean? We start talking about, and depending on, it's irrelevant of the sport. You talk about those concepts. Then you do some lead up skills first. So you start doing these small activities that are prerequisite for those ultimate skill drills to make sure students are ready. Do they have the coordination, the balance, the agility, the uh, capacity to perform these activities? Once they get to that point, you start doing small sided activities, one versus one, two versus two, kind of again, get them built with the relationship of the game. Then you eventually give them various roles. Every time they come into our intramural sports program, someone is the warm-up leader, someone's the equipment captain, someone is the uh, referee or the official of the umpire, someone is also uh, leading the team and, and competitive aspects of the day. And we do that because when you assign students every practice session or every session a role and responsibility, it heightens their ability to regulate their behavior. People are depending on them. We've defined the responsibility they have. They've practiced that responsibility. Then they carry that out. That is an important role. And a lot of times coaches take that lead in the traditional model, not a lot of times in the in the sport education uh, all the time, the sport education model. And it's non eliminative. And I put asterisks up here, triple asterisks, because I want everyone to be firm. I am not a supporter of just simple participation trophies. That's not the case. But it's non eliminative. We compete, we have a win, we have a loss, but we don't focus on if you lose, you're out, and now you're spectating. We focus on if you lose, you go do something else. We go from the competitive play to the recreational play. You go from the recreational play to the practice play. And you go in that cycle. You're not just out. Because while people say, well, that's how real life is, in professional sports, absolutely. In real life, that's not, we don't get eliminated if we're not successful. If I don't submit, if I get rejected at a grant or an article, I'm not eliminated from ever submitting there again. I learn the lesson, I make the tweaks, and I do something else. And that's the lesson that we want to promote in here is that you're not eliminated. And this is the last part. And this is really the part that coalesces why social and emotional learning belongs in the sport education model of intramural sport. The goal is to develop competent, literate, and enthusiastic participants. And I'd like to take just one minute and highlight something on this. When we talk about youth sport, it's expansive in the United States. We have ultra competitive travel teams all the way down to local school-based teams. The issue becomes, if you're not on the, if, if, if we're clear that the ultra competitive is about winning, and that's it. That's great. They're being honest about their true intentions. But everyone below that, if they start saying, oh, we just want to focus on fun, I would draw a caution to that. Because a lot of people think after hearing what I would say, oh, you're about fun and then the participation. Listen, kids want to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. That's fun to them. A snack is not fun. Playing random games is not automatically fun. Getting beat in a competition 52 to three is not fun. So they derive a lot of fun by having a voice, by having a choice and knowing what to do, when to do it and how to do it. So when I say competent, it's not about winning. It's about a process toward that. Winning will eventually come along for the ride. It's not a primary driver. We want them to be literate. Can they speak about the sport? Do they know the strategies? Do they know their role? Do they know someone else's role? Do they know the rules? And we wanna be enthusiastic. And, and here's the evidence I would give. For the last five years, I've been working with a school in Wayne Township. Prior to that, six years prior to that, for combined 11 years, I was working with a school in IPS for the majority of those 61, school 61, Clarence Farrington. And in those 11 years, the programs that 
my students and I have run, because I lean heavily on students, we've had retention rates of 94% and above from attendance from session to session or season to season or year to year. They're excited to come back. And also, let me say this, those of you that know something about um, out of school activities, we compete with every other school based after school program there is science club library boy scout girl scout and we are typically end up being the top producer of those uh, and have the highest enrollments and he, the kicker is we offer zero transportation and no snacks because we don't have a budget for it our students get excited and motivated uh, with focusing on uh, participating in the sport education model because they know they have a role, they have a responsibility, they're part of a team. And one thing I've, I've not mentioned either, and I should at this point, we also, we give them a voice choice fun and friends. Earlier we talked about, uh, at, well, we mentioned SDT, that was part of one of the parentheses, self-determination theory. That's a framework for helping everybody understand motivation. It can be applied at the adult level, young adult, adolescent, and child. When you talk about the self-determination theory, remember my responsibility is to teach my college age students what that means for them. To talk about self-determination theory packaged within one class gets difficult. If you can drill it down to the three key components, autonomy, relatedness, and competence, and we'll go back to that slide shortly, can a student decide for themselves on something, autonomy, relatedness, um, can there, is there a connection with others and competence? Are they good at what they do? This is, the, here's the lesson I would like to, us, us to consider on this. The gaming industry is doing a phenomenal job with autonomy, relatedness, and competence. Kids are drawn to gaming beyond any other thing because they've understood how to motivate kids. I'm trying to translate the research from the gaming industry into physical activity play, and there's some levels of success with it because we afford them a chance to have voice, choice, fun, and friends, and that's my pedestrian version of the self-determination theory. Uh, when I was in the camp uh, industry and I would do orientations and training for my staff, that would be what I would focus on. Do the kids have a voice? Do they have a choice? Uh, are they with their friends? And is it fun? If so, they will tend to drive uh, good attendance and, and, and good um, retention within these activities. The next one is the DESA Mini. So we have talked about an intramural sports program. We're doing it with a sport education model. We're infusing elements of social emotional learning and we're motivating them. How do we know it works? We have to have some level of assessment and evaluation. So within our program, what I've done is we've implemented the DESA Mini. Now, the DESA Mini is a subset of this first one, the Devereaux Student Strengths Assessment. It's a 72 question inventory. Each indiv individual inventory, it takes about eight minutes to complete for one student. Now think about that. If we're working with a classroom teacher and they're the ones that complete this for us, they have to take eight minutes. If they send me 20 students, right, eight minutes a student in a pre and post, that's not going to happen. That's just way too much time, two and a half, three hours just to do something on the extra. So what we've adopted is the DESA Mini. Uh, it has uh, been validated from the larger inventory. It's an eight question inventory that takes about a minute to respond to, and it aligns tightly completely with the principles of, of social and emotional learning. It allows them to notice change over time. So, as and it's supported by the World Health Organization and uh, the American Institutes of Research. Uh, they use this as a current tool. So, let me bring back and try to draw into uh, clarity where we started with today. So I'm putting in bold what I started with the earlier slide. What do I do? I've had this recently a five-year community campus partnership with a local school. We offer a comprehensive school physical activity program. It's truly service learning. If we didn't do what we did, it would not happen. It's not like our students are going there, learning from them and coming back. We're providing something that's not there. So it's just not learning, it's service learning. We're doing an after school intramural sports program that focuses on social emotional learning using the sport education model, not traditional sports. We're very intentional. Uh, also, as we consider this, it's a five week intervention. We'll talk about why that duration is important. 
we meet two times a week for three hours per week. So one and a half hour sessions. I'm on site 100% of the time. It's usually 4.30 to 6 or 4 to 5.30. And we offer this uh, in various seasons. The first couple of years, admittedly, in full disclosure that I work with community partners, I don't like collecting data. I don't want them to feel like my goal is to swoop in, get what I need and leave. I want to build relationships, build a trust factor. And I'll give you an example of this. At School 61, after the third year I was there and we were doing programming for 90 students each season, I got invited to be on their school improvement committee. I don't even live in the county. I didn't have kids that go there, but they found such a connection with what we were doing that they thought it would be neat to get a different alternative voice. So I wanted to be clear on that. Uh, but when since we started collecting data, we've, we've had about 124 uh, subjects in the treatment and the control, third and fourth grade students. Uh, we had a pre and post design where the classroom teacher and they had very little, if any, knowledge of who went to the program, the fidelity, who did not go. The principal and the lead wellness school teacher took care of the things on the school side of it. And they did a pre and post on the DESA mini. Uh, and if for those of you that just like to absorb things, if you just take a look at this, I can kind of de-emphasize talking through it. These are the generic takeaways. Well, I guess some of the more pointed ones about what happened. Now, if you need a little bit of guidance in looking at this graph, these graphs, if you look at the left, it's important to note the left left, gender zero, those are girls, gender one, those are boys. The straight line is the program intervention. The dashed line is the non-participants. They did not enroll in the program. So we have a treatment and a control, fairly equivalent. The DESA is uh, based, uh, you can see the average scores when you look at the composite of the DESA. We have raw scores. And, and by the way, let me also say this, this will be explained in the limitations in a couple minutes. The, the DESA is unique in assessing social emotional learning is unique. It's very different if you look at groups of students versus one student. The way that you look at the data is going to be a little bit different, and that's going to be a, a talking point in a, in a few minutes. So we know that certainly based on this, um, there's just a visual difference between boys and girls. And then third graders and fourth graders. Remember, the dashed line are the, is the control. The non-participants, the straight line is the control. So as you look at those, I just like to throw those up there because pictures say a thousand words, you can look at it and interpret it. And what I would ask is then if we look at the key findings, when we look at this aggregate of data, broadly, the difference between participants as opposed to their peer non-participants is profound and striking. The principal is really enjoying this. He's called in upper administrators uh, at the school corporation to talk more through it. And it has been a, a really pronounced difference when students are in this program. Now, when we drill down a little bit more and we look at it, when we look at gender, there was a statistically significant difference between pre and post of boys participating in the program versus boys that were not in the program. So the boys had a big difference. And I say that because if you remember that graph earlier, the girls did not present a significant difference. Factoring in grade, there was a significant difference between the third grade students participating in this program compared to the third grade students not in the program. It didn't reveal itself and express itself how we anticipated or one, one would have hypothesized for maybe the fourth graders. But again, there's limitations. We're gonna talk about those shortly. We did pilot work in this in the past, just to make sure, because he was noting observations, the school wellness, the classroom teachers. So we thought, well, let's kind of put this into practice. And our initial pilot work from a, year, a few years back really has kind of stayed consistent. Nothing has surprised us on this, but it is important to note that girls started with a higher uh, DESA, DESA mini rating um, from the pretest rating. So they just start higher. And there's a rate of diminishing returns. That's, we don't know why yet. Uh, we got to look at that. We're still in a lot of the infancy of it. So as I'm closing up, because I got about four minutes left, what I would like to do is just show a couple pictures. And here's why. In the work that I do, I know those of you that maybe do bench or clinical research, you might be shuddering at the scholarship of this, but here's the reality with action research and community-based research is that there's also lots of levels of impact. This picture right here, there's a lot going on. I hope you're soaking that in. 
primarily for many of these families, these are at the end of this five week intervention, we host a parent, grown up, adult, guardian invited festival that they can come and watch their children participate in a competitive sphere. Half of the people will come up to me or my students at the end and go, thank you for this. We have never seen our kids, our grandkids, whomever is uh, leading the family effort, participate in a sport like this before. This is one of the highest attended evenings uh, of families in the building. And we're just a group of IUPUI folks coming in, doing some work, walking around. That's all I do is walk around on Tuesday and Thursday nights. And we get this kind of a response. Uh, again, when you're looking at this, they're, they're excited. Some of the family members wear the team colors that the kids are using. And it's really, it's a neat testament to this community campus partnership that demonstrates the impact. Now, here's the last one I want to show you on the picture. And the reason I say this is we have a picture of one of the participants uh, that is in the official's jersey. That's one of the roles. Kids officiate the games. That's the role and responsibility. We don't have sponsored identifiable numbers. We have the green and the orange and the blue and the red old school pennies. We don't have marked fields. They're marked by cones. And right here in the foreground, if you see that hula hoop cut in half with the two blue cones, that's the net. And those of you that play soccer, you're like, well, that's not a soccer goal. Well, that's the idea. This is not about the adult version of a sport. This is about concepts. They're competing. We're keeping scores. There's going to be a winner and a non-winner, but it's not a tournament where we get one and everyone else sits and watch. It's round robin. So there's a lot of activity. And again, it, it seems simple, but all along, we're, every day we lead the session, we talk about the component of social and emotional learning. We talk about uh, self-management, about following direction, about being positive to class teammates, about um, doing things in order, about how you manage the emotions when you get to doing something you're not familiar with or getting frustrated in competition. So this also mentions it. Now in closing the last couple of minutes, let me also say this and then I'll go with questions and limitations. I also had the opportunity random and this is in the fall of 2020. So obviously, um, no, fall of 2019, it would be pre-COVID, fall of 2019. I was running this program and randomly enough, someone from the city of Indianapolis got a hold of me. They were giving a tour to international delegates from Saudi Arabia and they wanted to, and they were going into youth sport. They wanted to see something going on. They found me, I called the principal. He said, okay, I, the delegation of 20 individuals from Saudi Arabia came out and watched our event. That same night, uh, that morning, I was giving a talk to a group that came to our uh, campus from the Inner University Council of East Africa, a coalition of seven or eight countries of East Africa. They heard about what we were doing. They wanted enhanced physical education, teacher education in their, their composite of seven countries. They came out to watch. So we had like 40 international individuals, professionals watching this. And based off of that, so that was a fall of 19 in January, uh, I was January, February, I was flown out to Arusha, Tanzania, to the same international group, Inter-University Council of East Africa, for a five-day, six-day conference to walk through what we do with service learning, high-impact practices, using the sport education model for youth sport. So this seemingly local, innocuous activity has really expanded in powerful ways, and I hope the connection has been uh, made from that. Now, Here's the reality. As I'm closing up, I got about one minute. So there are limitations. I want to be clear, folks. Uh, this is an open enrollment. There's no referrals. So when we say we're going to work, when we work with the community partner on this, what do you want? When do you want it? What can we do? They open it up for everybody. It's been brought to our attention that we should consider some teachers referring students to the program if it can work on some of these self-management skills, because we have students of all abilities in this program, and I want to be very clear with that. We are not um, uh, selective in any way, shape, or form. If someone wants to participate, they're going to participate fully. Uh, so that is one limitation. There's no referrals. So there could be some level of a bias. Uh, we all suffer from the human condition. So whether it's my students and how they're implementing the program, me and how I train them, the evaluators, the participants, it's not super clean. It's a little messy. Uh, but the, we've gotten some good data on it. The sample size is certainly a little bit weak. Uh, it's not as robust as what it should be. But remember, when you're working with kids, there's some things you have to consider and vulnerable populations tend to be one of them uh, and some of the protocols for that. We have not looked at the family 
uh, as a form of an assessment yet. We do, the principal really wants that as one element. So we're working on that. And then please note when you're looking at the intervention thinking, oh, five weeks, that's a short period of time. Remember, we can't do this week one of the semester. I need time with my students to prepare them. They have the, the, the schools now are on balanced calendars. So, you know, there's only so much time where our calendars overlap and there's only so many resources. Remember, I have students doing this outside of class time, two nights a week. They could be working. They could be doing a lot of things. They buy into it so much that they come two nights a week from four to uh, 4.30 to six or four to 5.30, depends on what semester it is, and do this. So this is not perfect, but it is a great peek into if you can weave in the sport education model with social and emotional learning constructs, you can have positive impact on those behavioral outcomes that come along from physical activity. Uh, so I'm excited to share this and to tell our story. And I'm an N of one. There's 26 faculty in kinesiology that are doing the same thing. So in closing, I would like to give a hearty thank you uh, to Chancellor Bantz, uh, Dr. Petranio, uh, Petranio, I'm sorry for not saying that properly, uh, Stephen Viewig and Nori, and then the two um, community partners, the principal at Stoutfield Elementary in Wayne Township, Tim Wickard, and Aubrey Rudisil, the uh, third grade teacher who's the lead of the school wellness committee. Uh, and at this point, I would love to get some comments, questions, clarifications, or concerns uh, that you folks have. But I do appreciate this opportunity, Steve and Nori. And I am done. I think I hit the third, I was a little late, the 33 minute mark, but that was due to my inability to navigate technology. Well, and what we would like to use a different C word of all your invitations and call it a conversation. So I would love for folks to uh, turn their cameras on and unmute their mics. If, they, if you have something that you'd like to comment on or share, so we'd have a conversation with Dr. Ortel about his passion in this work. So uh, I invite anyone who would like to join in. I'll take a look here to see. Kathy Johnson, you've unmuted. Well, so I'll jump in. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. This was really fun to listen to. Um, and I'm excited because for years I taught, um, you know, graduate seminars in cognitive development. And I would, I would hasten to say it's not just the behavioral outcomes that are important exercise throughout the day. And we know from looking internationally at kids that have multiple opportunities for recess, you know, they do better in school, presumably because of the oxygenation that's happening in their brain. And it's just, you know, good for their overall health. So, so what I've been frustrated about in, in all of these years and leading conversations with students, you know, there's such tremendous enthusiasm for restructuring the day. And I, I hate that this is just an after school thing. What do you see as the major pushback for, you know, doing this throughout the school day rather than just at the end for students who are able to select in? Sure. Uh, that is such a great question. And you're highlighting it. So th th some teachers don't like to do it during the day because they don't want to get inherit kids that are wound up. Some people don't want it to do it at the beginning of the day because uh, transportation might be the case. So the key, this is, this is the goofy part of this. So this comprehensive school physical activity program, it's an ideology where it has to be locally driven. What is that local building? What can they do to enhance that? So are there opportunities for, here's an example of how we can't do the job right. Well, some buildings we can talk about go, oh, active transport. Why don't you have a walking school bus, have a bike to, um, school day, do all these things. And then you'll get someone in the rural area that says, well, it's 13 miles to my school. So that doesn't work. So it's the, so in summary, when I hear that question, Kathy, the hesitation is, is varied depending on the context. So the responsibility that I've tried to convey to current teachers, principals, anybody who will listen as a stakeholder in the schools is keep this local. What would work at your building? What is the culture of that community? I think five minute, and the more I talk to teachers, they now, and we realize 
so some and sometimes teachers don't want to do a, a brain break. Again, I don't like that term. It's a brain boost because they don't want to lead it. Part of the CISPAP is kids give kids the empowerment to lead those activities themselves because kids love that responsibility. Listen, kids are line leaders. They return the library books. They do the lunch count, make them a fitness leader. And that falls into the roles and responsibilities. So the hesitation is the lack of a built environment, the fear of teachers of losing control and some school districts with the best of intentions think that recess and physical education are not worthy because it goes back to the point I saw before. If you were to see me out at the Stout Field program, you would see me walking around with a clipboard and then the average person would go, look at his job. Well, how easy is it? They didn't see the three and a half weeks, four hours a day it took to get the community ready for this and my students for it. So I, th I just think there's a lot of misperception, but I do think it's local and what is best for the school. Now, some schools, uh, even here in Indianapolis area, school 19 is a super school. They start the day with physical activity. And, and then others of them are really big throughout it. And some of them, like you said, it, it's at the end and there was a lot of dueling, uh, dueling and competing interests. So I think it's a, it's a big conversation. One size does not fit all. Urban buildings have different constraints than suburban, than rural. And I just think it takes a champion and a team, right? A team of people, it shouldn't be one. The physical educator should be the lead, but they should call in the nurse, uh, one or two teachers, an administrator, a parent teacher organization, and then solve that problem. That is such a great question. Mark? Are there other comments out there? Is it, did someone say something? Joanna? No? You do? Well, I'm wondering if you could talk about the you, you've highlighted the campus community partnership and the value about that. And you really have done a nice job of involving students. And I'm guessing these are undergraduate and graduate students, but talk more about the, what you've learned around this campus community partnership and the benefits and how others could uh, learn from what you've learned. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. So the first thing is these are almost exclusively undergraduate students and also in full disclosure, they're usually at the junior or senior level. Uh, there's because this, you know, and these students are camera ready. I would put their ability to program not only the physical activity, motor development, but the social emotional learning really close to being what they would get in the, in a school uh, setting because they're that far along in their program. So I would say uh, the way that this gets started is just having conversations in that networking. Years ago, the principal uh, at school 61, she's since retired. And this undergirds the, the line that so goes the principal, so goes the building. Mm -hmm. They reached out and articulated to, to me, hey, you know, we need some help doing some of these programs. We don't have the staff. So I said, hey, how can we help? Then we said, well, here's what we can help you do. And I think involving the community with what they can because it's not a one-way street we're going to learn from the community my students are going to learn from the culture the community the needs so then we got together and again we just and like i did with the current principal at stoutfield elementary we worked together and saying how can we help each other to make it a win 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 our students benefit the community benefits their students benefit and it's just viewing it as a partnership i can't it, it is revolutionized uh, how our students learn, you know, it contributes to their e-portfolio. They can speak about something in an interview. They, it, it, there's so many benefits from this. And I think it's just taking a risk, extending yourself and uh, answering that call or email from a community partner. I think that's, it's really not, it's just not complicated. It's just being able to do that. Um, Cause it is a risk. There's a risk in what we do. Um, there's no, we have no inside, we have no budget, we're outside, you know, so we're worried about if it's 98 degrees with a heat index of, you know, whatever. I mean, there's just a lot going on. So that's why it takes me a couple of weeks to get my students ready. So we're not uh, doing any harm. We want to be doing the promoting of the good work. Well, as the licensed clinical social worker in attendance today, it, it doesn't, it's not lost on me that you pay a lot of attention to the relationship, which is how you get the opportunity to be part of the school program and the benefits as you were describing for everybody involved. So it's good for the students, it's good for the faculty, it's really great for the students in the school and the teachers and their families. I love that you talk about the success of, of family engagement 
Everybody wants to know how do we get families more engaged in the stuff that they might do with their kids. And you found, a, you demonstrated a way that could do it. And so how, how do you explain this to the layperson as a high impact practice? You know, that, how do you explain that in ways that people could understand? So, you know, I would default back to this speaker series. We're, we're allowing our students to translate course content into practice. And we debrief and we reflect on this every day, you know, after the session's over and the kids are walking home or they're getting picked up or whatever, because we don't provide transportation, we'll stand in their parking lot and debrief and reflect for 20 or 30 minutes. And then I have other written assignments for the students. So, so what I would explain is it allows us to take a concept that you read about, you hear about, and actually implement it. And listen, this is not, we've had some hiccups. You know, this, there's good and bad and ugly about this. And the beautiful thing is when our students plan something, they try it and it fails miserably. Uh, and then it's like, okay, there's a lesson in there somewhere. Let's talk through what we can do different next time. So that child has that positive experience and you convey what you want to convey. That's why it is, it's messy a little bit because, oh, there are some nights where I've had to intervene in these sessions a little more than I would have wanted to for no other reason because our students suffer from the human condition. Or a student that we're inheriting from the program had a bad day. And now we're getting somebody that's a little more keyed up and we weren't in the building that day. We don't know what happened. So it, it's, it gives us a chance to practice our skills in a real setting. And, you know, a couple of times we've had students get injured while they're competing, which is inherent. That's not the issue. But you know what the great thing was? I'd had a student that one of my students, so a senior here at IPY, one of their team members, a fourth grader, got hurt and, you know, got cut, you know, collided heads, accidentally fell, cut her head. And then they, she brings, the student brings the student up to me and says, oh, here's this. Uh, so you can tell the parent, I said, oh, no, no, you get to walk over and tell the parent what happened and how it happened. And boy, that was a, that revolution there. They looked at me in this moment of fear. I said, that's not my job. You ran a program. This is an inherent risk. And we supported the student, but yeah. there's a lesson in there. I mean, we didn't, we don't protect them. This is real life, right? Well, it sounds like it's a great opportunity for our undergrad students to have exposure to translational research and, and how that really can expand their educational experience and prepare them and whet their appetite for further studies and further uh, activities. There's a question that showed up in the chat about, uh, it says, based on your fly on the wall perspective, did the parents comment on the behavior of their child and did they see socialization? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that, Joe. Yeah. And I'll, uh, so I, let me bear with me here. Let me share one thing. A part of this that hasn't been expressed well is part of the voice choice fun and friends is that at the beginning of this season, we get the kids on teams, we give them markers and a poster board, and they come up with a team name, logo and poster, then they autograph it. Now that might seem innocuous to you, but here's an example that addresses this point. So every night they come in, they find their team after the second night. Some of these students take their posters home to share their to their family, the highlight of their day. And I would really love to be able to show you a poster, but guess what? On that last family fitness night, the kids bring them to us to autograph and they take them home and they argue about who's taking it home. And we solve that by, we tell them that they can hang it in their classroom teacher. And so the classroom teacher hangs it in their classroom for the semester of the year. And then they deal with who takes it home in the summer. But the reason I say that is we'll get comments from the parents at the uh, festival that we host for the grown-ups, adults, guardians, parents, and they'll come up and say, oh my gosh, my kid has never been so excited to come to school because he knew if he couldn't come to school, he couldn't go to your program that night. And he was up early and ready to go and had his red shirt on because he's <laughs> the dragons and that's their color. So uh, I would say that, yes, we. so that's why we want to start formally assessing uh, the family uh, viewpoint of this. We have not done that yet. So thank you for the question. Well, it sounds like there's some great opportunity and it's, it should be clear to everybody that's participating today that you are immensely passionate about this and you have done a wonderful job of helping us understand a little bit better uh, the, the value and the connections and very clearly across all aspects of this. And so I wanna thank you uh, for your willingness to participate in this and to share your translational research with us and to engage in this conversation. We are committed to uh, 
ending these sessions a few minutes before the whole hour so that people have a chance to go do what they need to do before they might start their next meeting. And so we wanna thank you all for joining us today. We encourage you to join us again next month when we talk to Phil Cochran about the next Black Swan. So check out the website at trip.iepy.edu so that you can uh, be up to date, follow us on social media, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you and have a great day.